So I'll give you a quick example. Aedes albopictus. This is work that was done at the CDC uh, almost 10 years ago. Aedes albopictus is a very serious disease vector. And what I want to do is use this as an example of what happens when you take that M circle, which is labeled accessibility here, and you broaden it. Okay? That's all I want to show you. So, here is the native distribution of Aedes albopictus, more or less, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and on the Sunda shelf. Hard to tell exactly what the native distribution of the species is, but each of those dots is a distributional point. And the purple shading is the result of a first niche modeling attempt. This is very old, uh, very dated methodology, but it's a neat example. And so where you see dark purple, those are areas that are reconstructed by the model as highly suitable, or as Richard put it, highly similar in environmental terms to these points where the species is known. And the light or white areas are places that are environmentally very different, okay, and putatively not within the niche. So I'm going to take that niche model and simply transfer it to North America. So notice that there are no occurrence points on this map. All this map is, is using the rules that we decided on in terms of environment, the correlations between occurrence and climate that we decided on in Southeast Asia, and we transfer them to North America. So all we did was we asked, they, I think it was in the study, um, what's the temperature, and what's the precipitation, and in Southeast Asia, would that be considered suitable? Yes or no? And so we get this map. Now, 1988, 80s Albuquerque arrives in North America. It jumped over the ocean with a little bit of help from humans, and it arrives in Houston, Texas, and then starts to invade. And so you can see the red counties are new county records through time. And that goes up to about 2003, which is when this graphic was produced. You can see how long I've been using this slide. But really, the invasion doesn't go much farther than that. Here's the interesting thing. The species invaded very, very rapidly, 15 years, and it covers a third of the continent. But notice that it invaded very rapidly out to the limits of its ecological niche as defined, as estimated in Southeast Asia. So you can change the geographic scenario, the geographic context, but the physiological requirements of the species stay the same until it obeys the same rules. And a really interesting thing about this is, think about the Altonian noise hypothesis. There's a whole different community of species here. And yet we didn't see wildly different behavior. Maybe if the Altonian noise hypothesis were false, maybe the species wouldn't have invaded north of there because there's some competitive. Or maybe there would be some competitive release and it would go all the way through the western part of North America. It didn't happen. And we've seen that over and over and over and over again. It's one of the bits of evidence that's really key in beginning to believe in the Eltonian noise hypothesis. You can project that worldwide, and you can say, OK, globally, what is the distributional potential of this species? And this species has really fulfilled all of that potential, or almost all, because what it does is it rides around in, in automobile tires that are being shipped globally for recycling. And it's very easy for it to be transferred from one continent to the next. Okay, one equation, don't get scared. It's not as bad as it seems, but this is a really, really critical point. It's something that Richard has already shown you, and I've just shown you graphically. But essentially, we can imagine the fundamental niche, okay? And that fundamental niche is constituted by uh, physiological limitations of the species, right? Now, the part
problem is the world, the surface of the world, does not manifest all possible combinations of climate for our members. Okay? That means that we can't observe the entire fundamental niche, which is to say the world is not a factorial experiment where we think all possible combinations of temperature and precipitation and humidity and this and that and this and that. Rather, our view of the fundamental niche of any species is reduced by the areas that it has explored, that's M, and also by the areas that have been sampled by humans to document that. And Richard showed you that as well. So really, what we can observe is this. This is what we call the existing fundamental niche. It's the part, the set of conditions within the fundamental niche that are manifested within M and within the area sample such that we can actually observe it. And so the existing fundamental niche is the fundamental niche reduced by, uh, I've simplified the notation slightly here, but reduced by the environments manifested within M and the environments that were sampled. Okay? Now, if the Eltonian noise hypothesis is true, that's the end of the story. Okay? It's the existing fundamental niche. If the Eltonian noise hypothesis is false, then biotic effects, that's this B, may further reduce the existing fundamental niche to what we call the realized niche. So this is more or less harmonizing the points of view and the terminology that we use with the terminology that Hutchinson used. So I want to make that existing point one more time. Imagine we have some environmental barrier. It could be rainfall. And this is the response. This is the fundamental niche of the species. It doesn't like dry areas. And it doesn't like really wet areas. It likes areas that have intermediate rainfall. And so there's some essentially cutoff where farther out here, the species, it's just not good enough for the species. And farther out here, the same. Okay. And so, outside of those limits, our species can't maintain populations. And that's the limits of our fundamental niche. Okay? That's in theory. That's if you put the species, nice big reproductive colonies, and you put it in a chamber, and you could turn up the, t the precipitation one millimeter at a time, do all those experiments, and watch the response of that population to those different levels of rainfall or temperature or whatever, okay? So, that's all simple. I hope that makes sense to you. Essentially, you can think of this as a measure of the population uh, potential of the species, and below this point, the species can't replace itself and the population is die out. Now, the problem comes in because on real-world landscapes, the representation of all of these variables may not be complete. So, for example, you go to Hawaii, and yeah, there are humid tropics on Hawaii, and there's montane tropics on Hawaii. There's no desert, right? There's no desert climates. Or you go to Greenland, and there's no tropical climates. And if you are restricted by your M to Greenland or to Hawaii, that means that big chunks of environmental space are not represented within your M. So the idea is this shows you the representation of those environments, the same environments, within the M, within the accessible area for the species. And so outside of this, we really don't know. Just as Richard showed you, that's an extrapolative region. We can't do much with that. And so that existing fundamental niche is this part. Okay? It's where the species can maintain populations, but out here, we really have no observations to document whether the species would maintain populations under those conditions or not. 
So we go back to this equation. We've already seen this. Now you see how the fundamental niche is reduced by these other factors. Uh, you also see this further reduction by biotic uh, parameters. The Altonian noise hypothesis would basically say that this restriction is fairly trivial. And another point that Richard made is that with SDMs, if we were really, if the object of our modeling were really the distribution, well, we only get what translates into the distribution out here. This is the environments associated with the areas actually occupied by the species after the effects of M, after the effects of S, and after the effects of A. And so it really says that unless you incorporate explicitly information about M, S, and B, you can't estimate the distribution per se. You're always going to get those extra areas that Richard showed you that are outside the M or outside um, the sampling that the species has had. We have the document the species. So I, in my view, and there are a lot of people who would disagree with me, this wins the argument. SDM applications, distribution modeling applications, really have to incorporate dispersal sampling movement of other species before they can purport to give you an estimate of the distribution. Translating all of that, species have physiologically determined environmental tolerances, that's A, right? That's the fundamental niche which translates into area A. The response is only, the response of the species to conditions is only observable where the species Curves. Okay, those are the effects of M. And also where we've sampled, those are the effects of S. And where the appropriate set of species is present, those are the effects of B. And so we have to be very, very careful throughout this whole process that we're going to explore not to confuse realized or existing niches with what are generally fundamental niches. That's a pretty critical point. So, again, remember we're going to work in these linked spaces. I want to do a little bit of terminology again. For, forgive us for repeating this stuff, but we really want to make sure it's clear. I want to go through geographic space and name some areas of distribution. Remember we talked about our species with this light blue uh, set of requirements there, which translates into this potential distribution. And so we have oh shoot, occurrence points, which we call G plus. Those are those crosses. We have GO, which is the suitable area, which is also accessible. We have GP, which is the entirety, the potential area. And we have GI, which would be this area, which is the invadable area. So that just gives us a little bit of distribution terminology to go along with our niche terminology. I think I've said all of that already. Uh, simply to re reiterate, it's not just an environmental or ecological phenomenon. It's not just a geographic phenomenon. It's a series of very complex interactions between the two. Okay, so that, about 20 minutes late, but that more or less finishes this big, broad, conceptual overview that 